Welcome to the Lean Champion Spotlight with Justin Uyar. Today's guest is Tammy McConaughey. Tammy, how are you doing today? Good. How are you, Justin? Excellent, excellent. How's uh how's the weather out in Colorado? Well, we just had a thunderstorm move in, so in a minute I might have to close my window, but it's been nice and sunny. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, awesome. So, Tammy, tell, tell us uh, a little bit about yourself. So I have been in the construction industry for a little over 17 years. Um, I have been a lean coach for going on about 10 years of that now. Those seven years um, were sp- not as a lean coach. I spent working for a mechanical contractor in San Diego. Um, my lean journey really kind of started before that, though, when I was pursuing my Six Sigma black belts after working for a branch of GE and really taking that forward with me when um, that branch closed and I found myself having to find another job. So that's when I started working for the mechanical contractor and was able to get my certification while I worked there. Um, Let's see, a personal side, lean is realistic because I have four children and a husband. (laughs) So so you have lean at home. What's what's one uh, lean at home thing you do? Um, I think my favorite thing that I did is, so we live 10 minutes from the local lake and we're, we're lake people during the summertime as much as possible. So like we have our bends that are marked, like here's our life jacket bed and there's like a checklist on top, like here's what's in this bin. And then we always know, like I always wash towels, put them right back or keep the snacks not stocked or so if it's like, hey, let's go to the lake. It's like load up the bends and the paddle boards and the kayak and go versus running around searching for everything. Nice. You just you just five s your your weekend activities. <laughs> yeah, I also use Last Planner system to get my son through his senior year of high school through his senior <laughs> projects. So <laughs> we uh, we had milestone awesome. discussions, we had weekly huddles and look ahead <laughs> meetings. <laughs> so, all of the above, you, but maybe a little bit less like construction. Were you the GC in that scenario? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was the owner. I had a good investment in his education. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. So t- 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 tell me, tell me a little bit about your your role currently at CRB. Yeah. So I'm currently my title has just recently changed from director of lean delivery to fellow of lean delivery. And what a fellow is at CRB is we have a group of fellows and senior fellows, and this is kind of our inaugural year, but they're people that are recognized as having a big impact on the industry in our subject matter expert field. And really what that focus too is not only supporting projects the same way that we would do normally, but how are we mentoring and passing that expertise down? We, um, CRB is really big in life sciences and food and beverage um, areas. So we have a lot of really smart people as far as like aseptic engineering and process engineering and all this stuff and watching them be able to mentor and pass that information down is just amazing. I mean, we're talking slews of patents and right research papers and all of this really cool stuff out there that's now being passed along instead of dying when that person kind of retires and goes out of the system. That's that's a good point. So give me give me some more flavor on that. What's a what's an initiative or a, a, a lean effort that that you guys are making right now? Yeah. So one of the big things right now is. Um, CRB was on a lean journey before I came came into CRB. And so there's a lot of that, a lot of excitement around that. But there's also a lot of that, like, we've already done this or we already tried this and it doesn't work. So having to re, re-engage some of that. But moving, moving away from the tool set and into let's make lean simple and the practical application of those lean principles has been a big engagement. So moving away from um, things like touch plan does not equal last planner system, right? Just because we're using touch plan does not mean we're doing last planner system. But before we even get to full-blown last planner system, let's just talk about how we're being accountable and making commitments. And then we can work our way up to last planner system. So helping people kind of unpack that baggage right now is a big initiative and get into how do we improve. Another one is how are we using PDCA every single day? How are we using it in our daily processes just improve and just fix what bugs us? Because as we get people excited about those 1% changes, 
then we get them more engaged and they see value in lean delivery. How, how, how are you doing that? Give me an example or, or tell me a story of, of a group or team that, that's using PDCA and what they've seen from it. So this, um, we're about ready to end our first two cohorts of Lean Champions. And Lean Champions is, are any role within the organization that is supports our core businesses, which is design, design engineering, and construction. And we put them through um, 10 months of a focus on just the Lean principles, practical application of the Lean principles. So no tools. We don't talk about Lost Planner System. We don't talk about TVD. We don't talk about any of that. Just principles. And so when we're one of the things with PDCA we really focused on is fix something that bugs you, just like two second lean. So having them do CI sparks, which is continuous improvement sparks. So what is something that you did today to improve something that didn't work for you? And we've seen things from, hey, like we just upgraded Bluebeam and like here's all the new shortcuts that I know that I use. I just made like a quick little template and sent it out to everybody so you know what that is and you can put it in front of you. Or, hey, here's, um, Tim Ho did one about like how he's managing job site keys, right? He put it on LinkedIn. Like those are great examples that get people like excited because it improved. It's really easy and it creates a spark, right? That spark creates a fire that gets everybody excited. And that's really what, putting PDCA into our everyday life. Oh yeah, that's all. That's awesome. Um... I see a lot of times, uh, and, and you mentioned some of the, the lean stigma, right? But people associate lean. It's not touch plan. It's not sticky notes, right? Sticky notes don't yeah. make it lean. Lean is that small continuous improvement that you mentioned. Some, something as simple as keys and, and, and shortcuts on the software. Um, what's what's another, because there there is a lot of, of lean stigmas, right? And people mm-hmm. misassociate it and misapply it. What's another way you've seen lean misapplied? Well, I think to getting down to like, it has to be this big, huge, right? This big, huge initiative or this big, huge change. Forgetting that that 1% every single day that we're improving adds up to 365% at the end of the year, right? So like focusing there, um, I wor- we worked with a school district out here in Colorado and they're, they're, when I worked at Dunn and their CEO, he, he said, just take a step just take one step, right? Like one step at a time. And I think it's not a race to be lean. There's no race. And we forget to enjoy the journey because nobody's going to be like, we're lean. Like that's <laughs> it's never going to be, but we forget to stop and enjoy the journey and just kind of let go of that outcome. Right. And, and how can I improve? What can I do today? And I think we get so caught up in um, that stigma of I can say we do pole planning or I can say that we do huddles or I can say that we do this that we forget to learn. Hmm. That's a good point. Why do you think that is? Because that because a lot of people struggle with that, right? That's a real yeah. struggle. What, why, why do you think that is? I think it's hard, right? It's hard when you're in a regular position, like a project manager or superintendent, and then they're like, hey, go learn this. Um, and and it's not like the lean principles, practical application is not intuitive. So we go to the tools because the tools are easy. You do this and then you do this and then you do this. But to figure out how I'm going to create reliable flow on my project, how are you going to do that? Right? Like, what is reliable flow? I think the other part too is we work in an industry that um, our business models are all around crisis management. Hire me as your GCCM, hire me as your design engineer because I'm going to produce this product, but I'm also going to manage all the problems and the daily crisis and firefighting for you. So if we start using lean principles, right, that switches that because it reduces the problems. Well, how do you work in that environment if you've worked that way for 20 years and you don't know anything different? What if you don't see the problems? That too? What if you don't think you have a problem? That's a lot there too, right? Like, I don't have a problem. Like, we just need to tell people how to do it my way, or this is the way it's always been done. Or, you know, working with a project team and being like, we've been using touch plan for the past five years and it's the way we've always done it and been successful. Like, okay, what's an improvement? <laughs> like, where do we go, right? It just happens. We as human beings get set in our ways. It works, it's comfortable. 
So I think those are our biggest impacts. We have a lot of work to do still. What, uh, what would you recommend uh, outside of, of call it the two second lean or, or small continuous improvement? What do you think is a good foundation for somebody to, to start their lean journey on? You know, um, I think the big thing is, is understanding the culture of lean. And there's, there's a couple of different things. Uh, I honestly, like my lean champions, we started out with this pocket sensei book. I don't know if you're familiar with it with from Hal Malcomer and Collide Davey. I might have just butchered her name too, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I'm familiar. <laughs> like, like that was because we could talk about we could talk about those lean principles, right? And then that has little those little short exercises to go put them into action and make you think. And so we we were teaming our lean champions. We team up with that, and then we would do. I would also do one on one coaching with them of. Did, what are you struggling with? Because we get in our own way, right? So there's things they'd be like, this says to take an hour to do this. I can't find an hour. And it's like, okay, well, then why don't you start with 10 minutes and then work up to an hour, right? Like we get in our own head and we get in our own way. So I think starting out with an intentional practice, even if it's just, I'm going to do a plus delta at the end of every day today, this week. And then at the end of the week, I'm going to make an improvement based off of what I plus delta or even the next day, I'm going to make an improvement to how I schedule or manage my day. Right. Just take a step towards that. And that's going to give just that one step, whatever that is, whatever, even if it's reading a book and learning more about it. There's so many awesome resources that we have out there now versus when I first started. <laughs> Yeah, it's 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 amazing, right? Between uh, obviously the Lean Construction blog and everything LCI puts out, and all the COPs, and even just folks uh, like yourself, right, out on LinkedIn <laughs> that that are presenting these things and and making them obvious and making them real. It's it's uh, a lot, lot of information out there. There is, I think too. Like, don't be afraid to um, talk to those people. I mean, I I take I try to make it try to answer every LinkedIn message I get if as long as it's not like somebody selling me something. Um, right. But don't be afraid to talk to these people. I just reached out to another like industry, uh, well, not really industry, but lean professional the other day and was like, hey, I read some of your blog posts. Like I'd love to talk to you more about this, you know, just to get your insight on it and ask you some questions. And of course he responded and was like, yeah, let's set up some time. So don't be afraid. Like approach and learn because I think that's the biggest thing that like lean really is about right a lean is continuous learning because you're continuously improving and if you're continuous learning then you're having these conversations and you're asking people about their experiences yeah I heard old uh and I'm gonna butcher the proverb right but but somebody said hey are, are we lean right mm -hmm. and he said I I don't know because I don't know what you were doing yesterday or the week before the month before, right? To, to yep. your point, it's about getting, getting better. There's no, there's no end. There's no magical stop to, Hey, I made it now. Yep. I call it the difference between doing lean and being lean. Doing lean is when we're just like, Hey, we're only doing lean on projects because it only applies to our projects. Being lean is when it's a part of our culture as an organization from day one, when an employee starts, we're teaching them how to be lean, right? It's part of who we are, and it goes all the way up to the very top to the very bottom. We're always going to be in this cycle, though, right? Like from doing to being. We're never actually going to just be still in the being lean. We're always going to be in this cycle because we're in this understanding of this is what I know. Wait a minute. There's more out there. <laughs> Like, right. <laughs> I need to learn again. <laughs> I need to learn it's, more. <laughs> it's the old saying, right? You don't know what you don't know. Exactly. And it's called the Dunning-Kruger effect, right? When they, they talk about the Dunning-Kruger effect of like, when you get to the point of realizing, hey, that's, there's so much more out there that I don't know. That's when you can truly call yourself an expert. It's when you think you have nothing else to learn that you're not an expert. Right. Because it's when that realization of there's so much more out there because you you see the bigger picture versus that little piece in front of you. That's right. What What's some of the, the feedback that, that you get is is you when people come in and you're introducing them to the culture. Right. 
What's some of the feedback you get? Oh, most, you know, I'll say the most prominent thing is, is, oh, I already do that. Oh, I already do that. Right. And then when you break it down and really dig down deeper and trying to understand, okay, when you say that, like, what are you doing? What, what are you doing? You find that there are elements that people are doing because they've just naturally picked it up from somewhere else. But you also find that too, what they're associating is not, is not lean. And so it's kind of having to have that conversation to help them understand this is how it's different. So especially, I think it is, especially for me, I see it a lot more prevalent on the construction side, especially when we're talking about collaborative and commitment-based planning, less planner system or any of those elements. People are like, oh yeah, yeah, I used sticky notes on my last project. (laughs) But then, right, when we get down into it, there's still the command and control and dictatorship. It's just in sticky notes. (laughs) Sure, yeah, there there was still the the lack of collaboration, right? The lack of input. Yep, it's just exactly. Now, I took it from a CPM version to a sticky note version. Yeah. <laughs> but I use colored sticky notes in a Sharpie, guys. <laughs> <laughs> so what what's some of the challenges um with scaling that within the company, right? Because you can't you can't be with every person um throughout their day, throughout their project. What's some of the challenges of scaling that? Wow, um, that's a big question. So I will have to say like this role for me at CRB, it was quite a learning, it was a learning role. I didn't have a similar role to this at Jada. And so coming into this, it was a big, huge learning curve for me, which I mean, was my sweet spot. I love, I love being in the uncomfortable seat. So, right. And and knowing that I have so much I have to go into, um, CRB is a global organization. So we're not just dealing with the U.S. I'm dealing with um, offices in Switzerland and Germany, right? That we're, we're how do we how do we translate over into a different culture? And so there was and there was this huge excitement for all of it that I I talk about like coming into CRB and then being on a journey and this is set in their ways. There's there's still this huge excitement of wanting to do this for the most part. And so scaling that is is challenging. And so starting with our lean champions and getting to them to where we're pra- they're practically applicating the lean principles and then allowing them to share their story was one part of that. Because we have to come a- overcome a little bit of that. Well, this is, again, this is the way I've always done lean, right? And, and get past that so we can get into the growth part. So having those lean champions who are really excited and, and taking that forth. And then also too, um, I mean, my job is really to create the the need or the pull, so that that way we get to a point that lean co- we're we're hiring regional lean coaches because there's such a strong desire, such a strong need. So that takes a lot of time and effort of putting in not only training, not only coaching and facilitating, but also supporting all different levels of the organization. So. Little challenging as an army of one, but very rewarding, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> tell me, uh, on the rewarding part, tell me a success story. Tell me about about somebody that that just took it and ran, or a project that killed it. Give give us yes. a success story. I'll, I'll I'll this is one of my favorite stories. So I'll actually talk about like one of my lean champions. Um, she was a group lead for a, a, an engineering group and she wanted to become a PM. And so they put her into a PM role and we really started to coach her and work with her on how to apply. Like just again, we just focused on collaborative planning because the team she had was not a, um, experienced with it. So we weren't ready to go full last planner system yet. Um, but just collaborative planning and starting to put into those difference of behaviors. Also, um, starting to get her to outline conditions of satisfaction with her team and ask questions to the owner to have a better understanding of that and doing some PDCA problem solving. I just got an email from her boss this morning and it was like, thank you for the time you spent with her. Like the growth we have seen out of her is amazing. And just to get that right, it was her first project that she pm'd and they pretty much yeah. let her go with it because she was killing it oh that's awesome yeah. i mean the work she did all the work like right yeah. she did all the work i just coached her ability but to really watch that come out like to fruition and to even hear her tell um 100 plus pms on a call last week like guys it wasn't a silver bullet it wasn't perfect but this is what i learned and this is what i can't wait to do in the next one it was awesome 
Hell yeah, that's awesome. Can we shout her out? Can we show her show her some more? Oh hell yeah. Oh yeah. Well, shout out to Rachel Poirier. She'll, okay. Awesome. She'll know. <laughs> Um, I think Tim, like Tim Ho is another one too. Yes, um, 100%. Tim, oh Tim was the man. Yeah, like his eagerness to learn and grow. And sometimes just like Tim and I have like, um, I think they're bi-weekly, co- like just coaching calls. Like, mm-hmm. hey, what are you struggling with on your project? You know, what can I help you with? What can we talk through? And just watching his depth grow too is just, right? There's things that he's like, ah, oh, I didn't think about that. Um, and it, it really just comes down to, I'm not telling him anything that he can't go read in the, read somewhere. Sure. We're just, how do you put this into application? How do you put this into practice, right? Just taking it down to that level and then coaching him through it. So he goes and does, does it. Yeah. I, I think it's sometimes it is sometimes what you mentioned earlier, right? We get in our own way. Yeah. <laughs> and, like that mental takes- block. Yep, and it takes that person, right, that coach to say, hey, just look at it slightly different. Yep. And we forget, right? I'll, like, if you look at any professional um, athlete, any celebrity, any actually, if you go look at any, most CEOs or C-suite individuals, they all have coaches. So having somebody that's coaching you in how to apply lane principles that's just part of like that's taking your your yourself to the next level, right? That's and we forget too. Like I think if we really look at like a lot of the lean principles, that's helping us be better leaders. Yeah, a hundred percent. And and I would tag onto that that starting to break down some of the company lines and and learning from each other, right? From different yeah. companies is is also a huge step in that direction. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. I remember when we first started um, the Lean Construction Community of Practice in San Diego, when I first started getting involved, we we had a group of us, um, and it was a professor from San Diego State University, Thais, Thais Dalves, and then also, um, I don't know where he works now, but there was a project manager for Rudolph and Slutton, and then also at the time he was um, a BIM manager for Balfour Beatty. Like we would get together and we would invite people in and be like, what are you challenged with? What are you struggling with? And it could even just be like, come to this job site. This is how we're doing collaborative planning. Like, this is what we're struggling with. Give me feedback. Because honestly, again, at the end of the day, there's nothing that we're going to talk about that you can't go find in the industry. And you can't copy and paste it because you haven't been through the same lessons learned we have. Right? So it's not... You're not not taking any propriety. Yeah, there's no proprietary information unless there is, unless somebody does have that hanging out there. But we don't, you know, but talking about lean, honestly, there's nothing that's going to, you're going to share that's not out there. It's just more about building on the knowledge. Sure, 100%. Because you could take that same sentence and you could replace lean with getting better. And you could say, how do we talk about getting better? Yeah, how do we talk about improving all the time? Right. Jay, Jay Nunn's famous tagline, and it was one of my favorite taglines, was um, pursuing building perfection. Like, right. We were constantly pursuing building perfection. Was it ever achieved? No, you never pers- achieve perfection. <laughs> <laughs> right. It kept you going. It kept you. It kept you going towards that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think like coming now, like bringing that back over to CRB, right? Like here, we're always chasing that um, building preeminent teams, right? That whole world preeminent, like we're never going to actually be 100% a preeminent team, but we're always going to strive to being that, right? So that like focus on bettering our teams, because it's about the culture. It's about the people. It's not about the tools. The tools are like 20% of our execution, the 80% is like the people and the culture and conversations that we're having and communication and all those human skills we forget about. Right. So yeah, we, it, sometimes we forget about just making the work better for the people that are, that are doing it. And a lot of us naturally in, in the way the industry set up, get removed from that. Right. Because mm-hmm. we're not out in the field or we're not on the job side or uh, we're traveling. Right. And we kind of get removed from the people that are doing the work and, and, that's 
ultimate lean, right, is when we can start mm-hmm. changing and bettering the work and making it easier and more efficient and get to know everybody from on the project top to bottom. Yep. To me, that's the ultimate lean. Our a manager's role is not to manage the output. It's to understand the constraints that their team has in front of them and to remove the constraints so they can do their work. But we forget that, right? We forget that. we got to meet a number. That's really, if you go back and look at like Dr. Dimming, the, the father of PDCA, that was a lot of what his work was around too, was process, but understanding modern at, at this time, this was like the 80s and 90s, and it's still very applicable, understanding modern management. And he did a lot of work over in Japan, but then when they were trying to bring a lot of what they learned in Japan from like Toyota and stuff like that, it was not translatable because Americans, we want, just show me, just show me the tool, give me the tool, give me the tool, right? Where in Japan, a lot of that, especially around Toyota, it was the culture they built. The tools were secondary to that. They built the foundation. Yep. Think about think about working at a factory that you know that as long as you are working towards bettering the system, you have a lifetime job. Yeah, and Matt, I mean, uh, I think about sometimes with the work in the field. Imagine where we celebrated somebody immediately cleaning up or planning their work or setting the stockpile 10 feet away from the ditch in a nice neat fashion right we we don't we don't celebrate the process uh, half the time we don't look at the process right we want the end result we want to mm-hmm. finish installing pipe by friday yep. but but we don't we don't go through that process that you're mentioning yep but like look at all those efficiencies that were created through that little those little pieces of work right creating a better workflow because we're not having to walk around all that material everywhere. We can go easily find what we need, things like that. Like I said, like, right, we promote people based on how well did you manage this project and all the crises and problems came up instead of, did you create efficiencies and create better work and workflow and help remove constraints and put out fires because you understand the root cause, right? Yeah, so, we get we get re- rewarded uh, for putting out fires that sometimes we created. Yep, exactly. Exactly. I love the construction industry. Don't get me wrong on this, but I just think there's so much opportunity out there, so much opportunity for improvement. And we, again, we get so stuck in that adversarial, like, you know, like design against construction and construction against design and construction against trade partners and design against trade partners because they're not engaging in the conversations we need them to, right? That we forget that we're all human beings. Yeah. Hundred you know? percent. So, uh, and you mentioned earlier that that you've worked for a mechanical contractor, uh, general contracting, and an AEC firm. Share share some perspectives from from each side of those in your experience. Well, we're all our own worst enemies again. <laughs> I think <laughs> I think it's 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 so intriguing to me to just really look at the processes that have been built to this point and how those processes that we've built um, really don't allow for a lot of innovation, but we expect innovation, right? As a mechanical trade partner, like I was sharing earlier about the schedule, I'll I'll, I'll give you an example here in a minute. As um, we're we're sharing the schedule, right? We get a schedule from a GC and we'd have to sign up for that schedule at contract, which we would. But if we would raise our hand and say, hey, we're really concerned about this, then we would be seen as being combative versus trying to help. You, you could be called not a team player, right? Exactly. Whereas then, too, right, we bring, we bring builders in and design early on. Because if we bring builders into design early on, then it helps us better manage the estimate and constructability at our early stage versus throwing it over the fence. But yet we don't give them the opportunity to speak up or when they do speak up, we tell them, well, this is the way we have to engineer it. So that's the way we have to do this instead of looking for a better solution. And I'm not saying that as a blank, I'm saying that as a blanket statement. I'm not saying that there's a lot of pockets of, right? Goodness, a lot of pockets of challenge. 
Yeah, hundred percent. But but one one of the most deflating things is asking someone, "Hey, tell me your opinion. Give me some feedback." And when they do, you say, "Ah, you know what? Uh, we're not doing that." Yeah, exactly. You, you you basically just said it didn't matter anyway, right? You yep. went through the motions. Yeah. Or or else you you run a meeting that you never ever engage those people into the conversation, but then get upset because they don't ever engage in the conversation. <laughs> right? There's there's all these little things that add up and that creates that adversarial relationship, right? We we often have design and engineers that approach superintendents and they'll be like, don't and this is not a, this is an industry thing, not just like not just a CRB thing, but don't tell me how to do my job. <laughs> like, right? We automatically go to thinking because that's the way it's always been. What are so so? Uh, what are some ways that folks at CRB can shout more people out or just be general? But what are some some ways they're breaking down some of those adversarial relationships? Um, yeah, like Daniela Gracie in our North Carolina office, she's another, she's really, she is, but she's a project manager in our North Carolina office in our Raleigh office. And she yeah. really, she's, she's been a construction PM and now she's being a design PM and just watching her, like being able to challenge that paradigm also, um, be able to challenge that and be like, wait a minute, guys, like, this is not like almost be like a translator, right? Like, hold on, let's take a moment. Not even that, but even um, challenge internal processes, because that's half the battle too. Challenging our internal processes as well as how can we improve these. Um, so being able to see her do that, she's been really successful at that. And and we even have owners that request her, you know, just because they've seen that happen with them. So, man, there's like, like a long list of names. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, but, but you bring up an interesting point because a lot of people would say challenge internal processes. Um, why why would I do that, right? I don't want to be the one. I don't want to rock the boat. I, yeah. I, I don't want to be the guy that's saying, hey, we're not doing this right. What what piece of advice would you give someone who was going to challenge those internal processes? So I think the one thing to remember is you need to check first, am I doing this process per the standard? Because we often go to challenge the process, but we're not even doing it the standard way that we have it documented, whether that's a best practice or a process or SOP or whatever that is. Am I doing this the standard way? And if not, why? Why am I not following the standard? Have I tried the standard? Like start there. And then if you try the standard and you're like, this does not work, giving that feedback to whoever owns that process or even asking the questions of why do we do it this way why was it documented this way right is this specific especially if you're in a large organization like crb is this maybe specific to one region it just became the company standard or did somebody not understand like the difference of needs depending on the industry and, and the geographical area that you're in right so just asking the why questions is the most important way to challenge that. Just going in and being like, this is stupid. It doesn't work. You're not going to win any battles with that. <laughs> I like uh, I, I like the point you made about asking the question, right? Because a lot of times we, we get that defeativeness, that learned helplessness, right? Where we don't yeah. ask the question because it's the way we've always done it. Mm-hmm. Um, I like the story about the Christmas ham, like, right. So it was the, the daughter's turn to make the ham for the family. So she called up her mom and her mom was like, okay, this is how you do it. And her mom was like, you got to cut off both ends of the ham. And she was like, why am I cutting off both ends of the ham? <laughs> and she was like, I don't know. Let's call grandma. Thank God grandma was still alive to answer this question. And so they called grandma and for, right. Gra I said, grandma, why do we need to cut off both ends of the ham? What does it do for the ham? Well, we just cut off the ends of the ham because the ham was too big to fit in the oven. So we just always had to cut off the ends of the ham. So here you are, three generations teaching to cut off when you, both ends of the ham when you don't even have that problem anymore. But we've just carried that, right, that response to that problem three generations ahead. And if we don't know why, then how do we know if it's applicable or not? Yeah, uh, yeah, 100%. 
What What do you think uh, on the the questioning note, right? What do you think or, or what's the the best way to to ask questions to find out that information? Um, humble inquiry. Even if you think you know the answer, ask the question. But humble inquiry really focuses on not like, what the heck are you doing kind of questions, right? But like, <laughs> hey, help me understand. Can you walk me through what you're doing and, and just kind of like explain to me why? I, in 10 years of being a lean coach, I've yet to run across any pull plan that I facilitated to be like, all right, you have this sticky note for, for three months of overhead roughing. Walk me through what these three months look like. Like, I, I don't know. Like, you know, like just to help me understand. And when you ask somebody why they're doing something and how they're doing it and just walk me through because I'm trying to understand and be curious rather than be confrontational, you're going to get a really good response. And people are going to talk through that with you. And so asking those why, what, and how questions really allows that person to show you how they do their work, which is what you want to understand. Because we in our head already are like, three months, why do you need three months of overhead roughing, like blah, 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 right? Instead of going in it that way. Then you're going to understand more of their thought process. So what, let's focus on on all the, call it the next generation of people coming in, right? Yeah. There's a lot of folks coming in the industry that that maybe don't have these they probably have some preconceived notions, but but they don't have this tough skin adversarial relationship yet because they haven't been in it. What what advice would you would you recommend to folks coming in the industry? Oh yeah, so back what well, back of the trailer training is the most important. I don't care if you're on the design side, the construction side. Back of the trailer training is the most important thing that you're going to get as a young professional in this industry. But you can't always just assume that's going to happen you have to engage and ask for it because that back of the trailer training is going to take you from what you learned in school and put it into to application, put it into reality for you. Because I guarantee you what you learned in school is not 100% going to apply when you get on that project, no matter what side of the fence you're on. Right? And so have asking those questions, right? Instead of saying, well, in school, we did this, this, and this asking those questions like, hey, this is what I learned and this is what you're telling me to do. Help me understand why, right? Can you show me? Can you, can we walk in the field together, right? That I think that is the most important thing that we need to do with our young professionals too, is we need to take the time also to do that because those are the ones that are carrying the torch for us. It's kind of like looking at if for those of us who have kids, it's kind of like looking at do we want to pass all our bad habits to our kids and have them keep going? Or do we want to make sure that they're better equipped? Right? Yeah. That to not have those bad habits. So it's, it's that's what we how we got to treat it. But but we don't. We just look at it as a nuisance or a necessary evil. Yeah, or, or just somebody to do our busy work, right? So yeah. they can knock off these tasks and it seems productive, but they're not actually learning. I get, uh, speaking with, with young individuals coming in, into the industry, uh, one of the most common questions I get is I say, hey, what certification should I get? And I say none right now. Yep. And they, they look at me funny, right? What do you What do you mean no certifications? I said, all, all your your goal now is to learn how to learn. That's part of what college taught you, right? Was to learn how to learn and you got to mm -hmm. keep doing that in the industry. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we hear like all these, I don't call them, I'll call them crusty old superintendents. That's not the way I was brought up or even PMs or engineers. Like when I was their age, I had to do it this way and I had to go through my steps. Man, what if we could make that period of having to learn so much shorter? Because like you just said, they're fresh out of college eager to learn, eager to grow. And what if we just like grew them right away so that they could be active leaders right away? Yeah, we got to uh, we got to break that cycle, right? I mm -hmm. mean, we get in this habit of of you have to do it because I had to do it. And at some yep. at some point we, we got to take that responsibility to break the cycle. Absolutely. Absolutely. 100% with you. We'll get there. We'll get there. Right. It's all about it's a journey. <laughs> so.
So we got about five minutes left. Uh, open open table. What uh, what else do you want to share? Man, I think the the biggest thing is don't give up, right? Like it's really easy with lean, especially or anything new, to just be like, this doesn't work. Like this isn't gonna work. This doesn't work here, or it doesn't work on this project. But don't give up. Like that's been there's so much more that out there. So don't give up. Keep trying. Um, and then also don't forget, like I saw one of the questions you had on your list was what was your favorite quote? And uh, another Dr. Deming quote was, you can learn a lot about ice and still not understand water. So just, just remember that you can know everything there is to know about being a process engineer, about being a superintendent, about right being a mechanical foreman, like, you know, but you also have to understand the whole project and how your process fits into that. So how does ice fit into the water? That that sounds like a little bit of, of systems thinking there. Yeah, yeah. And, and lean is a lot of systems thinking, right? Optimizing the whole. How If I improve this, how does it affect all of this? Or if this isn't working, is this a symptom of something upstream, a variation upstream, right? There's there's a lot of that built in, but we have to understand that or else if we're making an improvement or we're making a change based on what's in front of me and it makes it harder for the next person or it makes it easier for somebody up the line, but harder for us, is it really an improvement? Sure, yes. And take that step further. If it if it's more efficient for me, but worse for the whole. <laughs> yeah. So where does I always like to ask people this too? Where does a where does the first commitment on a project start? Where is that first commitment made? I'd say I'd say at well not at contract but at the interview stage. I was, I'd take it back even further. Like think about yeah. it when the business put together when your business put together their business strategy they're making a commitment that this is the value we're bringing to the industry. So there, that first commitment to that project was made there. This is who we want to be known as, as an organization. Yeah. These are the people that we're bringing in. This is the marketing that we're going to do. This is our business development. These are our systems we're going to be putting into place to support this project. But right there, right, we always start at the contract. Project is nothing more than a network of commitments. We take away everything. If we take away the design, if we take away the material, the equipment, the information, it literally is just, I'll get you this, I'll do this, I can deliver this, I'll put this into place, right? All you have is a network of commitments. That network of commitments goes all the way back. So how can we create a better network of commitments? That's a mic drop, Jamie. That's 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 a good one. That's a good one to end up on. <laughs> you caught me on like a day of like I've had like a lot of time today to like think about a lot of this stuff. So. Oh, you are you are killing it. Uh, that's awesome. We're gonna end on that one. Uh, <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's a good one. Oh. I can't be remiss if I do not get a shout out to Rebecca Snelling at RS Consulting because she has been a, 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 a she was my she was my leader at JDUN, but we've had a lot of conversations about that too. So she kind of freshened my memory from our conversations about that also. So yeah. <laughs> that's I not a soul, Tammy. I love the shout outs. I yeah. love it. Why not? I mean, that's the whole point, right? Is just create the conversations and the shout outs and recognize everybody. Because then people see them as like, oh, let me talk to this person. 